Good afternoon. Hi. Barbara Velasquez. I am the coordinator of International Intercultural Education at Metropolitan Community College. It is my pleasure to welcome you today. COVID-19 has changed the way many of us manage our daily activities. In my work world, in March 2020, we canceled or postponed approximately 18 cultural educational programs scheduled to be presented across the Metropolitan Community College campuses. Today, I'm delighted to say that we're bringing back one of the postponed programs, a diversity book series discussion on. If you would like to secure a copy of the book and are an MCC student, staff, or faculty member, please contact the libraries who will, the Metro libraries who will mail you a borrowed copy. They will explain to you how to turn since their buildings are currently closed. We ask that everyone silence your microphones during the discussion. Pending the number of attendees, we may break out into discussion groups. And thanks to Ann Wills, Terry Knipp, Cindy Cusick, Dr. Amy Force, and Gary Katz, who have agreed to help as our leaders. Your continued attendance at the International Intercultural Education Programming could qualify you for recognition throughout the year. To be considered Complete the online evaluation and include your name and contact information. The online address will be in the chat and on a slide at the end of the program, mccneb.edu slash IIEEVAL. I am very thankful today to today's discussion leader for her willingness and enthusiasm to get us started with virtual book discussions. Kale Seguir is the Educational Coordinator for the Institute for Holocaust Education and Coordinator for the Nebraska Holocaust Education Consortium. She is a former public educator who has taught primary, intermediate, and middle grades. She received the Milken National Educator Award in 2002, moving from public to private education and finally to homeschooling her daughters. Her own undergraduate study of history and philosophy established a deep desire to make the connection between the past and the present, as well as the head and the heart. The Institute for Holocaust Education, where Kale has been since the fall of 2018, is the perfect opportunity to blend her passion for teaching, the humanities, and relationships. Please welcome Ms. Kale Seguir. Thanks so much, Barb. That's the real reason I wanted to do this was to hear you say nice things about me and read my bio out loud. So I really appreciate that. Um, here's a quick look at the book. And it is a 658 page read. Um, it's worth it. There are a cast of characters. I'm gonna, as I'm talking, I'm gonna share my screen <clears throat> so we can see. I think I'm doing that. But why, oh, I know why. There we go. Um, and so you can get this from um, the MCC library. If you're affiliated with Metro, you can get this from the public library. Of course, all online booksellers. I do highly recommend it. There are a huge cast of characters. But before we dig in, I would like to just tell you a little bit about my organization, Institute for Holocaust Education. We've been around for 20 years and we do education programming for students, for teachers, and for the public. And we also run a speakers bureau. We still have two survivors that are able and willing to tell their story, although COVID has put a damper on that. Um, but we're going to dig right in because we don't have a lot of time today. And there's something I would would like to try with you all today. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. We're gonna talk about Ravensbrück. Um, this is a concentration camp, one of many, and I will, will just say for the record, people ask me all the time, like what's, what's the bit of information that you, you found the most shocking once you started this work? And the question is, I had no idea how many concentration camps there were in Nazi occupied Europe. And I wasn't even close when I was guessing. There, there were more than 44,000 concentration camps in Nazi-occupied Europe. 
But this was one of the first ones. It was in northern Germany. It was built in 1939, and it was, was billed as a re-education center for women. Uh, it was built for just several thousand women and ended up being expanded and, and held around 140,000 women uh, from 30 plus countries. And often when we think of concentration camps, we think of Auschwitz, we think of extermination camps, and we think of them full of Jews. But this was filled with many, many women from many countries. So who were they? Uh, there was a very um, extensive symbolic <laughs> regiment that people, uh, that the Nazis employed to put on the pajamas, the striped pajamas or the uniforms, the prison uniforms to identify who exactly was that person. Um, and when we talk about diversity, there was a great deal of diversity in Ravensbrück. So there were political prisoners like um, Yevgenia Klem. She was a Soviet POW, uh, but also political prisoners like uh, Greta Buber Neumann, who was a, a German communist. Um, and Olga Benario was a German communist, but also a Jew. So if you look at the bottom, sometimes the, the triangles would overlap. There were some legitimate criminals there who had been um, put in jail for real crimes. And there were some people there that, who were told they were criminals who had never been co convicted of any crime. Um, and sometimes the criminals and the antisocials got mixed up. So an, uh, if you were a prostitute, you could be a criminal or you could be an antisocial. Um, of course, the Roma and Sinti people were there and lots of Jehovah Witnesses. The Jehovah Witnesses did not bend a knee to anyone but God. And so they were extremely troublesome to the Nazi regime. There's a saying that there's a hundred ways to die in a concentration camp. And in Ravensbrück, there was slave labor. There was a medical experimentation. There was torturous uh, fatal beatings. Uh, there was shootings. There was gassing, among many other ways. It was uh, progressively became its own kind of hell. And many people uh, were there and each experienced their own story. But what I want to concentrate on today are the Germans. So the more women who came to Robinsbrook, the more guards they needed. Now, the Nazis had a very particular ideology about women. It was very sexist and misogynistic. Uh, mostly women belonged in the home, uh, having babies and carrying on the, the German line. However, they were needed out in the workforce. And so, especially at Ravensbrück, the more prisoners that came, the more women they needed to, to uh, take care of them because, you know, there was that definite separation of, of sexes. So they would lure these women in with promises of easy work, uh, a warm bed, enough food, and of course this is during World War II where all of these things are scarce. And mere survival was difficult for everyone. So often they would come in, they would take the job, and after the first week they would be in tears and asking to leave. But most often they were not allowed to leave. Um, and Soon they were given some, a nice uniform, a hat, a pair of boots, and slowly, slowly you saw the transformation from these young innocent women into people who became quite brutal. And the one I would like to focus on today is Johanna Langfeld. She was the chief female guard at Ravensbrück. And I would like to just take you through her life in the next few minutes. And so I'll just warn you, there's going to be a lot of writing on these next um, seven slides. I'm not going to read them to you, and you don't have to read them either. But there is only one known picture of Johanna Longfeld, and it's, and it's a very fuzzy picture. So I wanted to give you a picture of her life 
And if you would like, you can just close your eyes and listen. Um, and we'll see if this works. Uh, she was born in the year 1900 in a coal mining town, a blue collar town in the Ruhr Valley. And that's important because the Ruhr Valley was taken over by the French when Napoleon was around and then again by the French during World War I. So she was raised as a strict Lutheran. Uh, they prayed a lot. They prayed for family and they prayed for country and they were very patriotic and often described as a nationalistic family. So when she was 14, World War I happened and she watched the men walk, march off to war and then come back um, broken, as we know how awful World War I was. She knew her role was to become a wife and mother. That's what good Lutheran German women were supposed to do. Although she always wanted a little something more, she did what she was supposed to do and she got married to a minor who died two years later, leaving her alone. And after that, she, had, she moved to a different town, had an affair that left her alone and with a son. And at about the same time, uh, the Wall Street crash triggered this worldwide depression and she was horrified and afraid that her son would be taken away from her because she had no means of supporting herself. And she loved her son dearly. So after some soul searching, and it was her religious conviction that led her to work with the poor. And she started doing what, what we would call teaching home economics um, to, to poor women. Uh, and after she did this for a while, she was promoted to a workhouse. And this workhouse started shortly after Hitler became chancellor, was appointed chancellor for asocials. So asocials can be anyone from women of the night to homeless women, um, people who, who are poor, basically. So she did that. And, and in my synopsis, if you read that, I, I found out some extra information that she didn't actually get promoted straight from the workhouse. She actually lost that job and she was fired due to poor performance. And it was after she lost that job that she then joined the Nazi party. And the question is, did she join the Nazi party because she was desperate and needed to find work? Or did she really believe in, in the Nazi ideology? And from this book, it was pretty evident that she believed in the Nazi ideology. She thought very highly of Hitler and Himmler and was, was willing to do her part in making Germany the great country that they promised that it would be. So shortly after that, she was hired by Himmler himself to become the chief guard at Lichtenberg Fortress. This was a castle that was turned in to a bigger prison. So we went from workhouse, then they made this castle into a prison for women, and then they decided to make an entire camp. And many of these women from Lichtenberg came with her to Ravensbrück in 1939. So the picture that is painted up to this point is someone who really wants to be a part of something good, um, to work for her keep. She loves her son. She loves her country, and she's willing to put in the time and the effort. But there are little things throughout the book that help us realize she hated the Jews just as much as, as anyone. And once she got to Robinsbrook, she realized that she had a different point of view from her male counterpart there. And of course, um, Commander Kugel was in charge because he was a man. She fought with him uh, the whole time for control, but she also started fighting with herself as she saw what kind of corporal punishment Kugel wanted to impose on these women. It was said that Langenfeld Johanna never hit or kicked. Uh, sometimes she slapped. Some, she would often have these women stand at attention for hours at a time in the rain and the snow, and she was all about discipline, but not about corporal punishment. And that really started to gnaw at her early on. Um, Greta Buber Newman was her right hand woman. She was a German communist, uh, but someone that Langfeld 
um, began to confide in and work closely with her. And she was, has been able to give us the most insight into her life that she struggled. She struggled with what was right and what was wrong. And, you know, she prayed every day, begging for the strength to stop this evil from happening. So she was there for three years and then was promoted to Auschwitz. At this point, the final solution had happened. Jews were being deported by the thousands every day, and they needed to establish a women's camp at Auschwitz to hold the women who would be able to work for a while before they were killed. And when she got to Auschwitz, it was not at all what she thought it was going to be. She actually observed uh, the first gassing that happened there, and it left her shaken and distraught, and she immediately protested uh, about this. She knew it wasn't right. Then she asked to be reassigned back to Robinsbrook, and they said no. Himmler said no. And through a chain of events, there was a horrible massacre, um, prisoners on prisoners, killing each other. And after that, she was suddenly uh, transferred back to Robinsbrook almost as a demotion because they thought she couldn't handle it. And then the person who replaced her was, was a rather brutal woman. So by the time she got back, Greta said that she was in a horrible state. She was having nightmares. She shook a lot. She was paralyzed. She couldn't make decisions. But she still had this idea that um, Hitler didn't know what was going on in the country. And if Hitler knew what was really happening, um, he, he wouldn't like it. Uh, so she had very little respect, and she had no respect uh, and for the SS men that she worked with, but she still loved Hitler, she still loved her country. And, but it changed her dramatically. After that, she, she couldn't make decisions. Um, and it, she was eventually, after a couple of situations with the Polish rabbits, these were the Polish women who had medical experiments done on them, and, and she helped them. And after that, she was dismissed and taken into custody for excessive sympathy, although she never went to trial, and she went to work at BMW in Munich until she was arrested after the war by the US Army and extradited to Poland to face, um, the, uh, in, to face charges in the Auschwitz trials, um, strangely, instead of the Ravensbrück trials. But while she was in prison there, she escaped. Uh, the theory is that she escaped with the help of some of the Polish prisoners who were in Ravensbrück, whom she helped. So she escaped and she hid in Catholic churches and around Poland for 10 years before her Polish helpers um, were able to sneak her back through the Iron Curtain to West Germany to see her son and see her sister. And it was there in 1957 that she visited Greta Buber Newman and we have most of her story. So she's a rather complex woman. And I think in this very dualistic time, we often think of people as good or bad. We got the good guys and we have the bad guys. Most of us know enough about Holocaust history to know that the people who were in prison, the inmates, weren't there for any reason other than Hitler thought they were a threat to German society. Um, but the guards were there, uh, some, you know, often by choice. Well, they go by choice and then they're stuck. And then they see all these things happen. And the question is, how do good people let these bad things happen? And so I would like to kind of think about that a little bit. And I, I would like to walk around Johanna Langfeld's life, um, remembering that she was a sister and a daughter and a mother and a wife for a time and a lover, somebody who loved God and loved her country, and yet still allowed horrible things to happen. Now, she fought Kugel on a lot of these things that he wanted to do that she didn't want to do, yet she allowed the slave labor to happen. She allowed the beatings to happen. She allowed the standing in the rain to happen. Um, 
and she said at one point to Greta, Greta said, if you really feel that this, that, that this is awful, why are you here? And she said, I have to be here to prevent the worst of it. And when she came back in 1957, Greta said she was just an absolutely fractured human being. So I have some questions that I came up with um, that I would like us to think about. I need to kind of click on and see how many of us we are because since we're all on the same screen and can see each other, uh, of course, now you probably can't see my questions. Um, whoops, let's go back. Jason, are you able to copy those into the chat by any chance? Yes. Thank you so much. So I think maybe what I'd like to do is um, once he puts those in the chat, then I'll stop sharing for a while and we can just have a short discussion about this, if that is all right with you. Did you get those? Yes, they've been posted in there. All right. Now we can see everybody. If you've read the book and if you've read the synopsis, you might have some more information that you can share about Johanna um, during our conversation. But I am just curious um, where you see her virtue and where you see her vice. And since we're talking about diversity and all of these people from 30 countries who were there for different reasons because they were all a threat to Germany, how were they different from Joanna and how were they the same? And I'm, I'm super curious to see what you think about how she could hate one group like the Jews so passionately yet show excessive sympathy um, to the Polish Catholic prisoners. And then of course, here's the big kicker. You know, if you were Johanna, what would you have done? You know, that's always what I used to tell my students, put yourself in the, the shoes of the person in the book and see, try to think it through. What could you have done? What would you like to have done? And with that, I'll open it to conversation. Please feel free to take yourself off mute. You can also type things in the chat. Oh, we're on two pages, aren't we? Um, Keel, this yeah. is Marta. Hi, Marta. Hi, I did not get on until just a few minutes. I was uh, talking with my niece on the phone across the country because we have a relative who fell and ended up going to the hospital and she's already like 90. And uh, it turns out she has COVID and we don't know how in the world she might have gotten it. But in answer to one of your questions, like the fourth, how is it possible to hate one group of people but show compassion to another? Um, I've done a lot of work in cultural competence and all. And what I find is that sometimes people have these stereotypes in their heads. And so it gives them permission to dehumanize a particular group of people. And so evidently she felt that, you know, the people that she liked were more either like her or they were good people and they had good beliefs, but the other people did not. It's always the othering. We, we tend to do the othering business. It's happening a lot in our country right now. And that's very frightening, especially when you come from a group of people that have been the other. So I just wanted to share that. And Thanks people so do that without even thinking about it. You know, they don't think they're doing anything hurtful, but they are. Yep, but I think you're exactly right. We see things in, in someone that reminds us of ourselves. And so it's easier to be compassionate toward those people that we think are like ourselves. Mm -hmm. And easier to be fearful or angry towards people that we don't identify as people like ourselves. Exactly. But how people are alike is we're all human beings. And we have done such a, I think, terrible job of glopping people in different groups according to skin color and put all kinds of ridiculous value judgments on one another. And uh, I think we're coming to a place in our world where we cannot do that any longer if we want to 
you know, have a good community. Uh, we cannot do that anymore. I would agree. Um, Jason, I just noticed we have 36 people, which thrills me beyond belief. But that tells me that we should maybe do some breakout rooms so that more people can have a chance to talk. Is it too late for me to change my mind and say, break us out? Nope, we are ready to go. Oh, yay! We're ready. All right, we're going to have about 15 or 20 minutes in breakout rooms to discuss these questions. There will just be three or four of you, so hopefully we'll have a lot of time um, to discuss amongst ourselves, and then we'll regroup when we come back. Well, I hope your um, breakout room was as good as ours. We talked all over. We crossed hundreds of years of history and many continents in our discussion in, in those few minutes. But we have some time if anybody would like to share what they talked about in their room. Although I, I like to ask people after we've done um, breakout rooms that, that you don't talk for anyone else. You just talk about your own thoughts and not share the story that someone else shared just in case they don't want it shared. Any volunteers? I do want to say. Oh yeah, go say, ahead, Gary. Yeah, I do want to say that I'm I'm always unsure if if anyone who does a lot of evil can come back back and and do something enough to even the score kind of thing that. Uh, you know, um, someone who, who's, who's participated in uh, mass murderers can also have redemption. Um, I know that's a, a, a Catholic view that even on your deathbed, you could get redemption at the end. But I, I find it hard for through the Holocaust that um, people can get some sort of, can do something at the end for salvation after participating. That's, that's just my own personal view. Well, and it's a hard question. I'll just give you a little insight into Johanna. After she came back in 1957, she went to visit Greta Buber Newman. Um, she wanted to be understood and she wanted to tell her story. And at some point there, she, she says that she wishes she could go to prison at least for two years um, to make amends for what she did. And the two years stuck out to me because I'm thinking two years, <laughs> not very long to make amends um, for all the things that happened on your watch. Um, but that's a good question. Can you ever make amends after you do such heinous things? And did yeah, she I, think ever I think I think some I can't I don't know her first name a wills you're on you're muted oh there you go I was just gonna say that I shared that I I think war changes people and it affects people in a variety of different ways and and I, I, I think the woman was stuck in the situation she was in, in a time of war. My dad was a prisoner of war with the Germans during World War II. And he went away one person, he came back somebody completely different. So, so I think, and, they, and it's something that they don't wanna share usually with other people. And so I think it's hard to judge. I think she did what she, what she felt she could do. She still had a son to worry about. And um, so it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to live with. It's a really hard thing to understand. Um, and sometimes we forget that whoever we are talking about, whether it is a concentration camp victim or a concentration camp perpetrator, that these are whole humans um, with both virtues and vices and histories and dreams. And I think in this day and age, whether we are Republican or Democrat, it is equally hard because we, we like to, we like easy assignments. They are the good guys and they are the bad guys. Um, 
And so my hope here today is to send you away with what I'm calling questions for contemplation. So I'm going to share my screen one more time um, so I can get to this. Let me minimize that. And we won't... Um, there we go. We won't talk about these today, but I just want you to tuck them in the back of your head because my father, he was an English teacher for 50 years. And I remember one professor said, well, you really can't learn anything from a book. And my dad was like, wait, what? Of course you can, uh, and you should, whether it's a work of fiction or a work of nonfiction. And I think what, what he always wanted me to learn was how to be a better human being. So here's this question, you know, does, does Johanna deserve my compassion or my condemnation? or both, um, and can I relate to her in some way? And do I know someone uh, who reminds me of her? We, we talked in our breakout room of her being very religious, um, yet also full of hate toward the Jews and willing to compromise her values for her country. Um, and then of course, in the end, can examining her life and choices change the way that I examine my own life and choices? Because I think you hit up upon it when you said she was stuck. And, and I have heard this term many times from many people in my own life. I'm stuck. You know, I just got to keep doing what I'm doing. And where does that take us in our own path? So one of the things we use in Holocaust education and ADL facilitation is, is this thing called um, the pyramid of hate. And when Marta said othering, I had to smile because I thought I knew this slide was coming. Othering is a, is a word that was coined in 2016 and made it into the dictionary in 2017. And it's basically treating or viewing people as intrinsically different from myself. And as Marta was talking early on, we seem to identify with and have empathy for people that we think are like ourselves. And we tend to fear or walk away from people that we do not think that is like ourselves. But as we teach about othering, and in this case, um, hate, you know, it all starts somewhere. And the idea is if we can interrupt this at any point, you know, the attitudes, the jokes, the microaggressions, the biases, um, then maybe the, the attitudes will not go into acts of bias, will not go into bias-motivated violence, because another thing I, I make sure people know about the Holocaust is this, this was not all planned out in 1933. It happened gradually, just like Robinsbrook. The horrible things that happened in, in 1944 and 1945 were not planned in 1939. Things just gradually got more violent, gradually got more heinous, um, gradually got to a point uh, where we had a genocide. So at any point, if these things can be interrupted, then we have a chance of kind of pulling back on the damage that can be done. But in a situation where um, violence begat more violence, it just tended to grow. And in the case of Johanna as one person, I think she did feel very stuck that there was not more that she can do. And so in this time of, of intense polarity in our political system, I see a lot of othering and I see uh, that happening on, on both sides of the aisle, so to speak because it's very easy for us to say, look, we're the good guys and you're the bad guys, uh, whoever, whichever side you happen to be on. So I would love to take a few thoughts on that before we wrap up today. Um, uh, how do you pronounce your first name? Kale. Kale. Kale, um, I think we're heading in that direction and it's frightening. I heard the president say something on the news just uh, earlier today, and I think it happened late last night, but I was watching it this morning. 
and uh, he's, he's trying to delegitimize the um, election. And he's got his little path all worked out that if he puts somebody on the Supreme Court, I mean, he practically said these exact words that then that person will be able to vote and bail, bail him out and then he can continue. So, I mean, we cannot be naive and I disagree with you that both sides, I mean, that when we say both sides, we're just copping out, I'm sorry. And what I think needs to happen is that we need to be smart enough to figure out so we don't have another Holocaust in this country like we had in, in Europe. And there's even people who don't believe it happened. And I think that's so foolhardy. It did happen. And many people lost their lives and families were disrupted. And I see the same kind of thing starting to happen here. To delegitimize the uh, thing. In fact, I'm writing a letter to the editor because I've had it already. This is every time I go to write a letter to the editor, uh, something else happens and I think, oh, I need to write a letter on that. <laughs> so now I have to just sit down because it's very frightening. And uh, I understand the language. I understand what's happening. And, uh, you know, uh, and I'm a Democrat. I have to admit that. But even Republican people are caring people. And I hate to see them being, you know, swept away by this uh, language and uh, othering more people than himself. And so I think it's wrong. And I'm very scared, to be honest with you. Uh, about what's going to happen because I don't put it past him. He admires all the dictators and he's about ready to become one and that we cannot let that happen in this country. I love my country. I'm 83 years old and I've been through lots of things. We, I, my husband was in the Air Force. We lived overseas and there's no country like this country and we cannot lose it at this point. Well, Marta, you bring up, well, you bring up a, a really excellent point about um, taking sides because uh, Elie Wiesel, who is a survivor of Auschwitz, has a really famous quote that says, we must take sides because neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim, and Amen. silence encourages the tormentor and never the tormented. So I, I guess my question to you in closing is, how can we do that? How can we take a side without bringing the othering and the hate at the same time? Right. And how can we not become that which we hate? Exactly. Now. And so in, I was hoping today and I want to hear from other people how they well, in walking way. around Johanna that we could maybe see just briefly from the other side mm -hmm. i think personally that even both sides they they appeal to their people that support their campaigns lobbyists the people we, they really don't i mean they take they listen to what we say but i've seen democrat presidents i've seen republican presidents and the only person that changed my life was me i mean there was a couple of some policies do change but I think more the lobbyists, the people that's putting money behind these parties is the ones that are actually appeasing to and making the changes for it and not really doing it for the people. That's what I feel about it. I don't Robert, really do politics. Robert, I don't hate Republicans. What I am concerned about is our democracy. Right. And I did not start the hate business. Mm -hmm. So you I'm need just to saying, see, I where, think, where is the hate coming from? Ask yourself that. I think and, that when when I've had com when I've had conversations with a, a good friend of mine who um, supports Trump, and I say things like, um, "These policies have affected the people coming into our country," because we talk about immigration. Her response is, "No, no. President Trump doesn't hate immigrants." And when you said, Kale, when you said that, um, Joanna said, no, no, if Hitler knew what was going on, he wouldn't let that happen. Right. I, See? I, have, I have complete faith in Hitler that if he knew people were being gassed, he would not allow that. See, to me and my friend saying, no, no, he likes immigrants. I think that's complete and utter head in the sand. 
I and agree. it doesn't matter what I say yes. to her, she's always going to believe that Trump loves immigrants. And if I say there are camps, if I say anything, she just says, you're just listening to the wrong radio show. Exactly. And that, well, and I will. We are Cheryl for that. And we are so almost the, at when time. When the camps were liberated, when the camps were liberated at Auschwitz, Eisenhower went to the uh, to the town of Auschwitz, and he brought all the villagers into the camp, made them walk around, and help bury the dead. They said they didn't know anything, and he showed them around the camp and assisted with them. So there wouldn't be any doubt of what happened. I mean, people who lived in the same town didn't even realize what was happening. So it's, it, it's unbelievable how people can get away with things or how they can brainwash using a certain ideology that- um, Keywords. Yeah. 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 Well, and yeah. that's, you know, speaking of keywords, before I turn this back over to Barb, since we're almost at time and I wanna respect everybody's time, words matter and okay. sometimes understanding that we are sometimes we're using the same words and we have completely definitions different definitions yes. of those words so my mother 86 lives in Kearney um, still in the house I grew up in will say to me I just don't understand why they can think this way and that they changes depending on who we're talking about right I just don't understand why they can think that way and, and my response to her now is do you want to try Right? Mm. Do you want to try to understand why they think this way? Knowing that understanding is not always agreeing. Yes. And understanding is not always um, uh, saying that that's okay. But just to understand why they, whoever they is, because every time we say that, we are othering. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank you so much. This is such a great turnout today. I am so pleased to kick off the Diversity Matters Virtual Book Club. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Barb. Wonderful presentation. Great. Thank you. That was oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, great. That's amazing. That's an awesome thank presentation. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. To everyone. I oh, I wave at Aaliyah like she knows that she's in the top left-hand corner of my screen. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate the turnout. Um, I want to thank Ms. Kale Sagir one more time. She jumped at the opportunity to help us move virtual, and I think you will agree she uh, did a wonderful job. But we would love your feedback in the online evaluation, which you can find. The screen is up there right now at mccneb.edu slash IIE. E-V-A-L, um, we would appreciate that. And if you give us your name and contact, we keep a record of attendees and you can be recognized throughout the year for your continued participation in all of our activities. I also would like to point out that, um, well, your conversations will continue forward about this. Please um, consider getting the book and diving further. Um, it was a ro it's a robust book and it's a robust conversation. So there's no way we could get everything we wanted done in one hour, but we hope that we've whet your appetite to consider that. Mm -hmm. Also, um, our next book we will be exploring is, can we have that slide, Jason? Thank you. White Fragility, Why It's So Hard oh, for People yes. to Talk About Racism by Robin D'Angelo. And we're very excited that Eden Wales Freeman, Friedman, PhD from St. Mary's University in Minnesota will be our discussion leader. That's scheduled for Tuesday, October 27th from 10 to 11. It will again be virtual, <coughs> excuse me. And um, you'll be able to find information about that um, in an email from me or at mccneb.edu slash book series where you can uh, see all of our um, it, upcoming book series opportunities. I wanna thank our technical staff who are doing an amazing job with us. And one more time, thanks to Ms. Kale Seguir. Have a wonderful afternoon.